This is the uh, Nashorn session. My name is Jim Lasky. I'm the uh, lead of the uh, multi-language group in, the, in uh, Java Tools. And uh, this talk is uh, going to be a little bit of background behind uh, this project. Um, it was a little tricky to, pu to put together because I was thinking that uh, you know, with an existing language like JavaScript, there's really not too much you can, you can say that would be interesting. So what I'm gonna try to do is focus on specific things that uh, Nashorn does that other, like, uh, other versions of JavaScript uh, that doesn't do. So our safe harbor slide. So the first thing I'll talk about is, uh, is the engine itself, uh, the history, history behind it. Uh, talk about how you would use Nashorn uh, either uh, directly or uh, as part of your Java, Java code. Uh, I'll go run through some of the features that are specific to Java, uh, to NAS, JavaScript Nashorn. And uh, we'll do a few demos and then finally wrap it up with, a, with a, some final notes at the end there. This is the uh, Raging Red Rhino. That's sort of our unofficial logo. So Nashorn is pronounced Nashorn, not Nashorn, not, not Nashorn, but Nashorn. Um, this is to pay homage to uh, its ancestor, Rhino, which has been uh, on the, the uh, JVM for a long time. Nashorn is the internal project that uh, was started about two years ago, actually two years ago in October, uh, to uh, develop a, uh, an ECMAScript uh, compliant uh, version uh, language uh, to run on the JVM. It started out as an experiment to see how hard it would actually be to implement JavaScript from scratch. Um, and uh, it, it took hold, and uh, the group has gotten a little bit larger in the last two years. Uh, we're uh, following or tracking edition 5.1 of uh, the ECMAScript standard, uh, but we're also tracking evolving ch uh, changes in standards. So um, as new standards come out, we'll be updating uh, NASHORN with, uh, with the U releases um, as things change. As I said, uh, Nashorn is a uh, clean database, or clean uh, source base. Uh, it what, doesn't take anything from Rhino. It started from scratch, and it was primarily designed uh, with 290, using 292 um, as its uh, basis, main basis. It's much smaller and significantly faster than, uh, than Rhino. And uh, we're tracking the performance of other vendors so that we get ourselves uh, up to the same level as uh, what you're seeing in some of your browsers. So why would we uh, want to do uh, JavaScript? Why would we want to do scripting at all? Well, we find that uh, there's a lot of, um, of tasks or applications where it would be appropriate, or it seems more appropriate to do scripting than actually to do a full, full implementation of, uh, of something in a higher level language like, uh, like uh, Java itself. It has a dynamic style. You, you can do things, prototype things fairly quickly. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to, to develop something in JavaScript than it would be to, to start the whole process of de developing a Java program. Um, what, it, what this JavaScript does that other JavaScripts don't do is that it gives you access directly to uh, the rich Java libraries that are out there. There's, hu there's a huge number of Java stacks out there uh, covering all kinds of things from networking stuff to embedded system stuff. And we want to be able to access that from our scripting language. So that's, that's the big thing, is that uh, Nashorn talks directly to, to uh, Java. We chose JavaScript over other languages because uh, uh, it has a fairly similar syntax to Java, um, but it's, it's fairly different from Java in, in, in the, the scripting capabilities. It's also, the choice is driven by the popularity of HTML5 currently and pe more and more people getting involved in JavaScript. And we hope to attract more developers or newer developers to, uh, to the platform. So which platforms are we targeting? Well, these are the three main ones that we we're targeting initially, but um, obviously there's other possibilities like, uh, in the future. Uh, the embedded mobile uh, market, the client side and the server side. Uh, in the embedded side, because we're smaller and tighter and, and faster, it, it's, uh, it fits quite well in, in uh, some of the small devices that are out there. Actually, we'll be doing a demo at the end of the, uh, the talk here. Uh, 
where we're actually running uh, NASHORN on a, on a uh, Raspberry Pi board. One of the things that you should consider about uh, JavaScript versus Java is that JavaScript is a smaller payload because it, you have a fairly s small text item that you can pass around over the network or store in your application. You don't have to, to download a whole jar. So it, uh, it works quite well uh, on the uh, in embedded systems. Uh, the client, this, the, on the client, we're looking at different possibilities. Uh, I'll be showing a demo of it. Uh, that's where I'm using Java uh, FX. Uh, there's also a possibility of uh, hooking into WebKit, uh, the, the web node object in uh, FX. There's currently a project going on where we're trying to integrate NASHORN in. Um, in the slide about the FX, we, we note that there's a tight integration uh, of NASWAR into Java, and it, it's really very natural to use uh, uh, FX from NASWAR, uh, maybe even better than from Java. On the server side, there's obviously, there's already existing stuff that uh, uses JavaScript, uh, JSP. There's uh, business processes uh, that use JavaScript. And there's a, a couple of other projects on the go within or, uh, Oracle, which uh, are uh, bound in JavaScript. Uh, one we'll be demonstrating here later is Node.jar. And uh, Project Avatar, which is uh, server client side uh, JavaScript. It's a, to your advantage to think of JavaScript instead of Java as an alternative to Java, because the, the, when you're hiring people to do uh, development of uh, of um, server systems, server-side systems, um, it's fairly easy to get uh, people who are working in JavaScript. So if they could work in JavaScript on both sides, then um, is it, it's, it makes a good investment or for better investment. And, uh, and one of the nice things too also is that uh, uh, if you think of Java as being a somewhat static system, you have to uh, uh, build your application up uh, well in advance, uh, you know, package it up and uh, download it or ship it to wherever it's going to actually going to run. The nice thing about JavaScript is that uh, you can modify it once that product is shipped. So uh, one of the things you could consider would be using JavaScript as a configuration language for your field engineers. If they need to reconfigure your application in the field, it'd be a lot easier to, to, to tweak up the JavaScript than it would be to uh, mess around with the Java. Uh, just a little bit further on, on Node.jar. Um, not, not a lot of people outside of Oracle really know about this. I just thought I'd uh, bring it up uh, a notch a little bit here. Node.jar is uh, Oracle's implementation of Node.js running under uh, NASHORN. Uh, originally, it was started out as a, as a test bed to see if NASHORN would scale up to handle uh, Node.js. Uh, but if you know anything about no, the implementation of Node.js, Node.js is actually a lot of native libraries, uh, a lot of native code. Whereas if it was running in the JVM, it needs to, um, um, to use Java instead. So what we're doing here with, uh, with Node.jar is actually uh, in, uh, building up Node.js, but using Java as the underpinnings of it all. Java and JavaScript. So currently we're focusing on the core modules, but then we'll be building up uh, to be able to handle larger, larger units. Uh, this is, uh, give you an idea of status uh, of the project at this point. Um, we um, um, had been focusing on getting our compliance up right from the be beginning because we wanted to make sure that we had a good solid version of JavaScript. So that was our, our main focus. Uh, so we, um, we had this, this, this creed of compliance, correctness, and performance in that order. So we're, we've got to the point where our compliance is pretty good. Um, this was actually the test I just ran these on Thursday, so that's uh, fairly current. Uh, we're actually only uh, failing one test, and I'm sure by the, the end of this week or the end of next week, that test will be working as well. So, um, so we will meet the compliance uh, requirements uh, of uh, the ECMAScript environment. Uh, it wasn't made to, the slide wasn't really made to make the other guys look bad because uh, there are really only eight or 12 fails and they're not really anything significant, but it's just to give you a sense of that we're up there with the rest of them, so. So we're on track to deliver. Um, as I said, we're close to passing 100% on the compliance test, uh, 262 compliance test. 
our task now is uh, to harden it up, uh, be able to scale it up to bigger projects, um, get the performance levels up. Um, so, you know, still have a fair amount of work to do. But since we're shipping with JDK 8, we do have some time to get this right. Uh, as announced yesterday, Oracle is planning on proposing NASHORN as being an, uh, an open JDK project, and that should happen fairly soon. Um, so uh, we want people to come on board to help us develop new technologies with NASHORN, and then also make improvements to, uh, to our existing stuff. So um, this, you can think of this as being recruiting uh, to, uh, to join us. And as I say, we're going to ship with JDK 8. So uh, this is a similar slide to what was in the keynote yesterday. We, so we've we've uh, started talking to p uh, different organizations about joining us on the NASRM project. Uh, IBM, NetBeans, uh, Red Hat, and Twitter. Um, so uh, I have a couple uh, people who are willing to come forward and talk a little bit about it. Uh, so Sam, you want to come up? So Sam Pilera is with uh, Twitter, and uh, he did a little bit of... Uh, Goofing around on the weekend, <laughs> we, we gave him a uh, an early release of uh, JDK8 with uh, NASHORN installed. And uh, can you tell us a little bit what you did with it? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been I, you know I've known about this project for a while because a friend of mine works on it, and uh, it's I've been really excited by it. You know, at, at Yahoo, I, I built uh, y, the YQL engine to do its server side JavaScript uh, performance with uh, Rhino because of the ability to control, tightly control things. Um, but you know, the, the actual performance of the Rhino engine is, is, is pretty bad. Um, so the, the first thing I did was, was play around with Nashorn um, to render mustache templates uh, using both the default mustache.js uh, library and then also another one uh, created by a Twitter employee called Hogan.js, which uh, basically the idea is there, you, you provide a template, you provide it backing view code and JavaScript, and it renders out pages. Um, I, I was blown away, uh, one, that first of all, everything just worked. Um, <laughs> there were literally, I never ran into actual like a correctness bug uh, with the Nashorn stuff, which I guess that, you know, that bears out their compliance with uh, 262. Um, and then on the performance side, it was in, in, in the, the, the most challenging test, it was more than 20 times faster than Rhino. Um, and, and, I, and I imagine, you know, uh, having actually written some invoked dynamic code for mustache.java uh, and knowing how, you know, what, what's left there to, to capture, I think, uh, I think we're going to see some pretty amazing performance from these guys. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Also, I'd like to uh, ask uh, John Ciccarelli to come up. Uh, John is with, uh, is the director of engineering for NetBeans? Yeah. So uh, we've had a long relationship with uh, NetBeans. They were one of our earliest adopters. And uh, can, maybe you can explain what you guys uh, did with it. Sure, sure. So uh, how many people saw the, the Project uh, Easel demo at the, the keynote last night? You guys check that out? Cool. Um, yeah, we were very excited to roll that out. Um, it's our new initiative for HTML5, JavaScript, CSS tooling um, inside the IDE, and specifically hooking it up to Java services in the back end. Um, and we completely rewrote our JavaScript editor support um, off of our old infrastructure, and we rewrote it on top of Nashorn. Um, don't know how many of you know, but um, uh, NetBeans actually uses Java C um, as a library to provide all of our Java, um, uh, all of our Java uh, editor features. So you always know that when you get an error in the Java editor, it's the exact same error that the compiler is going to give you. Um, but we do the same thing with, with Nashorn. We use Nashorn to go through, parse the, uh, the, the pages, um, and provide things like, you know, simple things like indentation and code coloring um, to more complex things like refactoring and code completion. Um, it's really helped us because, as we all know, JavaScript is a notoriously hard language to uh, build a structure of. Uh, because it defies structure so much. Um, but um, we've been able, uh, using Nashorn, to, um, to really build a pretty intelligent editor that learns as you type, right? So as you are, are creating um, JavaScript, to say, objects, it'll recognize the patterns and say, oh, hey, that's an object, and, 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 and provide you the correct, uh, the correct uh, code completion and so forth with it. 
Um, so we were really interested in getting off of Nashorn for a lot of reasons, uh, performance, legal, and so forth. Uh, performance was a huge reason. Um, people are very sensitive to the time it takes to scan a project. Um, uh, when you first open up that project and you get that, hey, you're scanning, please wait, yeah, you know, and you gotta wait for it to scan and scan and scan. Well, scanning the JavaScript files with NAS with with Rhino was actually one of our biggest bottlenecks, um, and so we were. We were, uh, I have to say, when we started, we were a little bit worried about performance. That was the number one thing that we were worried about, and you guys totally blew us away as well. Um, and then the other thing we said, wouldn't it be great to have an in-house thing because, boy, you know, we always need to patch these things, and there's always bugs that we need to work around, and there's always these things that we need to do to kind of get around it. Um, and so it'll be nice if it's in-house in because then we can, you know, work with it as we want. But I'm pleased to say we haven't had to apply a single patch except for a little one to let it be run on, on JDK 6. We haven't really had to do anything to it. We've been able to use it outside of the box. So it's been a pretty fantastic experience. Good. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, as uh, John said, uh, describing about the parsing of the uh, JavaScript language, uh, JavaScript is a um, very painful language to implement uh, in a lot, a lot of ways. So, okay. So, how would how do you use Nashorn? Uh, so, uh, one of the more, probably more obvious ways of uh, people using JavaScript uh, uh, in, in, as a tool, you would use. Uh, um, a command line interface, so we have this command line interface that we'll be shipping with it uh, called Nashorn. Um, you can use it in interactive mode or, or execute a file. Um, but in fact, actual fact that th this is just a shell uh, to the way Nashorn really works underneath, and that's uh, using uh, JavaX script. Now there was a talk just before this one, I don't know if anybody here attended that, but uh, a guy from IBM was talking about the use of uh, JavaX script. Um, if you use Java X script to uh, initiate your Nashorn session, um, you can do a lot. Um, you can create your own shell specifically for your task, or you can actually embed Java, uh, JavaScript right in your application. So if you have a text editor application and you want to use JavaScript as a way of reformatting uh, the way the text is laid out on your page, this is how you could do it. It's really very straightforward to do use. Uh, if you, you should look at Java X script uh, in detail, it also gives you ways of binding to, uh, to uh, Nashorn objects, um, so you can actually read and write properties of uh, objects. Um, it's a fairly powerful tool to work with. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the implementation of Nashorn. Nashorn is actually um, one of the driving forces behind it is that we wanted to, to fit in well with the Java world. We wanted to make it, um, you know, use as much as Java as we possibly could without actually having to uh, going off and reinventing things. Uh, it's been a, a big advantage to us because the thing is that we were able to pull up a working version of JavaScript fairly easily by leveraging Java fairly well. But it has also made it easier for Java and JavaScript to talk to each other, uh, programs to talk to each other. Objects and arrays within JavaScript or within Nashorn are actually uh, um, a fairly high level object uh, that's actually ongoing. There's ongoing changes in uh, the implementation. Um, so they're, they're somewhat opaque to Java users, but it's uh, fairly easy to access the properties and, uh, by uh, using the JavaX script uh, binding mechanism. Um, Internally arrays, you use primitive arrays, so you should expect good performance, the same similar performance to what you would get from, from Java. Um, we're experimenting with tagged arrays. Uh, as, you, as you know, if you've used JavaScript, it's an untyped language. Um, a variable x can have either an object or reference to an object, or it can have a primitive value assigned to it. So we need to be able to work back and forth. So a tagged array is a way of actually implementing a structure where we can mix pointers and, and uh, uh, numeric values or primitive values together. Functions are implemented internally using method handles. Uh, so we're taking full advantage of the 292. So when you call a JavaScript method, it's going to be using 292 to, to, to uh, invoke dynamic to get at that, uh, the, the code for that method. 
Uh, string, numbers, booleans, and the primitives are all native. Okay, so if you pass a Java string off into, into NASWARN, it, it treats it like one of the JavaScript string, and the JavaScript string goes back the other way, so there's the one and the same. Same with boolean numbers. Uh, date, regex, and JSON are special. Uh, there's special raw objects for those, to, to mostly the game performance. But there's accessors for, for being able to get that from the, uh, uh, from the Java side. As I said, everything uh, um, was based on using 292 um, for as much as we possibly could. Uh, so whenever you do a, a, a getter or a setter operation, either by direct property or by using indexing, whenever you make a call, whenever you create a new instance, that's all using invoke dynamic. And what that means is that at runtime, when you're actually executing, that particular section of code can be replaced with whatever we want. Okay. So just to break it down a little bit, so say if you had an expression like var x equals receiver dot property, the receiver can be an Aswarn object. It could also be a Java, Java object. It could be a Java beans object. It could be a JRuby object. It could be almost anything. And at runtime, when we encounter this, we can look at the receiver and say, oh, we have to, to call this method or we have to invoke this code in order to handle the situation. We look up, look up the best fit. So in this particular uh, sequence, we have you know, object is equal to um, A and B or the property with pro properties A and B. And then the second uh, step there is we want it to uh, access the property B from the object. So this becomes a dynamic call to get the property B from object. So, we, so then when that, when that is encountered, we look up the B property in the object and construct a method handle that handles the, ex the uh, extraction of that value from the object. So then bind the call site with that method handle and from that point on, we don't have to do any further lookup. We basically just say, oh, we already know how to look up B from that object. So we, it's basically becomes as fast as accessing, let's say, a, a, a C field from a, uh, um, in, a, in a C program. We also have to put a guard there because the thing is if the object that's coming in changes, we have to be able to deal with that. So if it was a, an Aswarn object before and becomes a Java object or a Java Beans object, we need to be able to adjust to that. So we put guards in place to handle that. To deal with all of this, uh, we, uh, we use an existing library uh, that actually uh, was written by one of the members of our team. Uh, the library is called uh, DynaLink. And what it, does, it's, what it is is a module system that will allows you, allows you to, um, to create units that determine how to, to do the lookups and, and the bindings uh, for these dynamic calls. And because we've used this mechanism, it was fairly easy to add Neshorn to look up. Java uh, knows, how, knows how to look up things on Java objects. But it also has the possibility of looking up things, looking up things for, let's say, JRuby objects or Java bean objects or specific types like how, how to treat, treat um, a map object as though it looked like a JavaScript object. So because of this, we can, uh, we can do uh, lookups fairly quickly and fairly easily, be fairly uh, type-specific lookups. Uh, we can do value conversions, uh, handle any overloading. Let's say if you have two methods in the, in the Java class, that, that, that there's a conflict in the, the arguments, we can handle that scenario. And you can do some special default handling. Uh, makes it very flexible. So one aspect of the, uh, this would be something like, uh, something like the uh, no such property, no such uh, method implementation. So what we can do is um, we can define uh, a, uh, a special property within the global space here, it could be in any, any uh, uh, um, prototype, uh, where we can say that if you can't find the property, this is how you, then instead of giving us an error, handle it this way. So in this case, we're in the global space, we were saying, okay, we're defining um, a function that's, that uh, uh, sets the 
the property is undefined and returns undefined. So you'll never get an error if the property doesn't exist. It'll just always just return undefined. So it gives you that kind of flexibility. Similar sort of thing here with the J adapter. The J adapter is an object um, that you can define how you deal with gets and how you deal with sets. So if you create a J adapter object, then um, the property doesn't exist. Uh, you can get it to uh, look up that property in a database, as an example, uh, or look for the, the value of the property on, on the network. You can, you can adapt it to do wh whatever you want it to do. As I said, uh, we're fairly, uh, tied fairly closely to, uh, to Java, and so in order to use Java, you need to be able to access uh, packages that are in Java and other classes, or in classes that are in Java. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, to get a bare bones class from scratch, you use packages, dot, and then the name of the class. Uh, Java, JavaX, and JavaFX are all built in. Uh, so uh, as globals, so you can access them fairly easily. So if I wanted to get the integer class, or let's say the utility class or package, I can just say util equals Java util. So that gives me the, the util pa package. And that, that's a shortcut that you can use within your code. Uh, and if you want to access, the, say, the integer class, you can just say integer equals uh, Java lang integer. And what it will do is assign the integer class to integer, and you can access it directly that way. There are some Java, as I mentioned before, some Java objects that are, are one and the same on the, uh, on the uh, NASWARN side. So for instance, integer, we can use integer in internally. So you can create a new integer. Uh, and then you can treat it as though it was a, an integer value and you can do arithmetic on it. The main thing here is that uh, because of what Dynalink is doing and connecting up with, uh, with Java, um, you can treat uh, Java objects as though they were JavaScript objects. So uh, if I want to get the value of uh, function or method from uh, integer, I can just say integer dot, and this is, to, 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 this is assuming that I got integer class before. Uh, I can just call integer dot value of and then give it the string and then it will return an integer value. If I want to access the global uh, max value from integer, just integer dot max value, and then it returns the value. Okay. Uh, Java subclassing, uh, it's possible to uh, subclass um, Java objects um, just by using the notation of new, and then the Java class, and then open brace, and then what, add whatever properties or override whatever properties that you want to override in the, uh, in the superclass. So in this case, we want to uh, uh, override the, the uh, run function uh, in the timer task. So we just say property name, run, and then give it the function we want to call. So then we, we end up with a subclass of uh, timer task, which will call uh, this, this run that we've uh, specified here. We've also set it up so that it handles uh, SAM automatically. So if it's a single access interface, uh, then uh, you can put the function in directly. You don't actually have to construct the, the object. It deals with it directly, the same as, uh, as the line bell functions would. If you're working with a Java array, it, uh, it, internally it's handled just like a JavaScript array. You can uh, extract values from it. Um, you can um, insert values in the array. You can also iterate over objects in the array. So the for loop will automatically allow you to iterate over anything in that array. Actually, will allow you to iterate over anything that's iteratable. Iterable. You can handle Java exceptions internally uh, in your uh, JavaScript code. Um, actually, this is probably not a good example. A better example would have been I could actually say catch instance of file not found exception and it will be able to deal with it. Uh, there's a, this is a, a tool that allows you to import a whole bunch of packages all in one fell swoop. It's a, uh, uh, Java importer. And once you've imported all those packages, then you can use the with statement to actually apply 
against uh, code within the brackets there. So in this case, uh, Matt HashMap is a, is a member of the uh, Java Utils package. So uh, you can uh, access it directly that way. And finally, uh, one of the features we added fairly early on was the ability to write shebang scripts, uh, style scripts uh, in, uh, in NASHORN. So this allows you to uh, throw away your Perl and your Python and whatever else you write in uh, and actually write things directly in JavaScript. Uh, so we added the features of uh, you know, uh, pound comments, being able to access the line args and the environment args. Uh, you can load other scripts into your, uh, into your script. Um, and you have here strings and be able to add, do edit strings from within the environment. OK, so at this point, uh, I'm going to do a few demos of some of the things I talked about. Just uh, ignore the, the transition here. Yeah, I think that's probably okay. Can everybody in the back see the screens fairly well? Okay. Okay, so the first example I want to show is, uh, since Sam mentioned mustache, um, uh, we were just sort of scrambling around trying to find uh, some examples uh, that we could uh, demonstrate, and, and, and Sam was quite uh, interested in a mustache because he had done uh, uh, mustache.java. Um, so that, that came up and we, we said, well, how are we going to make this work to, uh, for him so he can go off and do this testing? And So uh, um, it was pretty straightforward. It wasn't that hard to do. So, so this is what a, a mustache input would look like. It would basically be these mustaches around uh, substitution areas that, uh, in the text that uh, you want to work with. Uh, and then you would also provide, um, um, well, it's basically effectively a, a JSON uh, type thing, um, a way of uh, actually generating the values that are used in the mustache substitution. So in order to uh, get this going, what we did was um, um, just created a little shell. We could have probably, we probably, if we tried hard enough, we could probably have done it through the NAS Sorn command line. But uh, we just did, implemented a little shell here, which um, um, all it does is, let's a sec here, I just want to hide the, um, uh, hide the navigation bar, whoops, hide the toolbar. What is it I'm trying to hide here? Hide files. Uh, good, thank you. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, so um, basically this just sort of wraps it all up uh, for us, but, the, but the, the interesting parts of this is that we have a, um, we get a script engine manager, and then from the script engine manager we get ourselves an, ins uh, an instance of the NASFORN uh, script engine. Uh, so from that point on is our engine that we're working with. Uh, and in the um, body of our code here, we, we fetch a string, um, mustache string, which is basically to load mustache um, source code, and then we evaluate um, uh, the clear cache. And then further on, we load the files that are of our template and data, uh, and then execute it. So, just to prove that we can actually execute this, if I can bring up worksheet. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, see if we can do this. It's going off and executing JavaScript. And there it uh, executes and uh, fills it in. I I'm assuming that Sam's uh, Benchmark was a little bit more complex than that, obviously. Um, okay. 
Oops. And so just hide. And okay. The next example I want to show you is um, is this. Um, this one is a little bit more complex. This is actually uh, built on uh, Java X, uh, FX. I was running through the examples uh, of Java X to implement, and uh, um, there's a lots of cool things, and I think you all understand what's going on. But um, I thought the one that just sort of was, you know, glitzy but not too complicated, so that we could actually do it, was the fireworks example. Um, so um, just. What the fireworks example is, is um, we'll, run, well actually we'll just run it and then you can see exactly what's going on here. Okay, so the fireworks example is um, basically just a, a, a picture in the background and then drawing fireworks across the screen. But the interesting thing about this one example is that each one of those Particles is a JavaScript object, an Aswarn JavaScript, uh, script, JavaScript object. So the, the actual glowing and the movement and everything is all done in JavaScript. Okay, now again, we, we probably could have done something from the command line, but again, we wrote a shell. It's a similar sort of thing where we, um, we would um, Create or create a new uh, a manager, script engine manager. Um, then we ask it to create an instance of uh, Aswarn, and then uh, for, further on here, uh, we would uh, actually read a file uh, that we execute. So it's reading a, a JavaScript file that we're, uh, we want to execute, and uh, the JavaScript file is this one here. Uh, so this is basically the FX program. Uh, all written in JavaScript. And uh, towards the bottom here is something fairly interesting. I think that this sort of, whoops. Okay. The, this sort of give you a sense of what you can do. Um, this is using the subclassing. So we want to create a subclass of uh, Java, Java F, uh, FX application. Uh, and we need to override the init, the start, and the stop function. So this is how we do it. Uh, so this is the sort of the driver for, uh, for our actual application. Um, what I also think is fairly interesting about this, uh, um, fairly interesting about this application is, uh, uh, originally it was written in JavaScript. It was sit sitting in the Google JavaScript library, but then the FX team took it and converted it into Java to run as their examples. But then what we did was we took the Java and converted it back to JavaScript, and uh, it looks fairly different than the original. Uh, um, the original JavaScript, uh, I did a, a little bit of a compare, but um, for most por for most part, the logic is fairly, uh, fairly much the same. Um, one of the things that you should note here is like, uh, because we recognize beans, there's actually no um, child property in root. It doesn't actually exist. There is a, a getter, a get child, and a set child in that class. Um, but because of the way we've implemented um, uh, Java beans, it says, okay, I don't see a child uh, property there. Let's see if there's a beans accessing uh, mechanism there, and we'll take advantage of that. So you can write your JavaScript code fairly naturally. You don't have to worry about the beans conversion. It's all, all uh, happens for you. Okay, so the next um, demonstration is, uh, is uh, Nashorn running on a Raspberry Pi board. So, do you want to take it over? Okay, can we switch to yeah. this one? So. <coughs> so here on, here we are. Dave, got see if you can get the mic on. Yeah, mic is on. Yeah. Okay. So here is the Raspberry Pi, like later on you guys can come and Yeah, you have look. to talk into the microphone. Okay. <coughs> And here um, there you go. Okay. Uh, I did uh, I SSH into the into the Pi. I um, you can see that this is running 
7U6 Java IC embedded. <coughs> and I just started this node.jar with um, a program called Fortune that I wrote, which is a Fortune server. And I'll show you the source code for that. It's very simple. It just, sorry, it just forks the Fortune command, takes its output, and pipes that output to the HTTP response. And you can connect to it from the browser, and you'll get a, some random function every time. So this, this fortune program is just a standard node program. Here is another one which is a little bit more complex. Me. Kill this guy. Oops. And this is a date server. So this program calls into uh, Java to get the current date. It formats it using another Java call and then sets up a timer. Every one second, it writes out the, the current date to the client. So the idea here is that you can call into any, pretty much any Java API seamlessly and then stream the results back to a client. It takes a little while to start up. And I'll show you two clients connecting to it. One is this curl. It's not ready yet. There. So now it's ready. And here you get the current date and you get the same thing when you the browser. The browser will ends up caching a few responses, so this shows up in a, in a little while. Basically the idea is you can call into any, J this Java API that it's calling into, it could be a JDBC API or any other enterprise Java API. How many lines does it have to cache up? Uh, there, there you go, okay. Good. That's it. Okay, that's it. That's it, okay, good. Okay, so the, the, the uh, point here is that uh, it's, S1 is fairly lightweight, so um, it fits in uh, embedded devices fairly nicely and works quite well. So, okay. Slides again. Yes. Uh, so the Node jar is that something that's going to be shipped separately from Node.js? Yeah, the actual. Um, the actual process involved with Node.js is uh, still up in the air, but um, um, it should be, it, it'll be, it'll ship separately, but it'll be involved in a different process. So it's not, uh, the current thoughts, well, I can't actually get into it much, but it's it should be re re readily available, so, so. Okay, so. <coughs> Also showed it running with JDK seven. Yeah, it runs in JDK and runs in JDK eight. If it becomes an open JDK project, will it be targeted at JDK seven? Um, Node JS or NAS or in generally? Okay, so uh, currently we're doing well. Originally we did development on JDK seven, but uh, we ran into some technical difficulties that pushed us up to JDK eight. But the plan is to get it back ported to JDK seven. Uh, we won't go back as far as JDK six because that would be technically really tricky to do. So um, I'll have a Q and A session in a second. Just let me wrap up here. Okay, so just to, to, to follow up here is that we have a good solid implementation that plays well with Java. Um, we're tracking the ECMA standards fairly closely, so we're going to try to keep on top of it. So as an example, we have uh, typed arrays 
sitting in the wings, ready to go in as soon as the standard comes out. Um, it scales to a variety of platforms, runs on embedded client and server. Uh, we're going to be making the uh, OpenJDK uh, project pr proposal very soon, uh, and we plan on shipping with JDK 8. Um, we're also inviting you to become involved with the, uh, with the uh, open source project when, once it becomes available to help uh, contribute to, to the environment. Uh, there's a couple other sessions involved uh, the, with the discussion of uh, NASHORN. Um, we have uh, a session that occurred this morning uh, about the optimization uh, go that we're doing inside NASHORN. Uh, there's a uh, Birds of the Feather uh, tomorrow night or tomorrow afternoon for the Java uh, NASHORN team. Uh, there's a Birds of a Feather shortly right after that in the same room, I think, um, for the uh, Node team. A node and, and uh, actually some EE guys uh, discuss uh, data persistence. Um, we'll also be involved with the polyglot discussion and finally uh, uh, Attila is going to be talking about uh, Dynalink uh, in the session on Thursday. The session on Thursday. Okay, so uh, Dave, if we have the lights up, we're going to have a Q&A session. Okay. Yes. I'll, re I'll repeat the question once he says it, okay. So, as uh, usual Java arrays, in this case, how the access uh, beyond bounds is handled? Okay, so if I, if I have a Java array and it, uh, I'm trying to index in it, into the array, um, the, invoke, the invoke dynamic uh, will uh, say, see, or through Dynalink, will see that it is a Java array and uh, we'll insert code which will do a Java-like indexing into that array. And what uh, happens if I access a property uh, outside of the length of the array? It will give you a, uh, um, a, an index out of, um, out of bounds exception. So it preserves... Uh, it preserves the Java-ness of it, yes, yeah. Okay. Yes? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, that market is kind of wrapped up right now, <laughs> in, in some ways, but uh, we, we originally started out as a, um, a s sort of spin-off from the Java X project, uh, FX project, where they had a language called FX Script, um, and uh, realizing that it wasn't going to be quickly adopted, we thought, well, maybe we should fall back on JavaScript. So originally we decided that, uh, um, I think of Nashorn as a client, but then as, as we started going along, we started realizing, oh, this has uh, EE applications, server-side applications. So we started focusing on that um, more so than on the, um, um, on the client side, and this is where Project Avatar and the NodeJar uh, no kick in. Um, but we're, we're hedging our bets and we're going back the other way. So uh, there's currently somebody poking around uh, and integrating Nashorn into WebKit. Um, so I'm not sure where that project is going to go or how, that, how it's going to pan out, but it, it should be, f it's not an easy thing to do because WebKit is massive. Um, we also mentioned here that we're thinking about in terms of writing applications using Java uh, FX, so you could effectively do a browser-like application uh, using Java FX. So um, it's a little bit further down the road, but yeah, it's a possibility. So. The DOM APIs are, are not implemented in NASHORN. We don't supply them, but there are, uh, there are versions that, that you can download and put in, but they, they won't do any graphics work. You need to do the graphics side of things, right? So um, there is a tool out there, and I can't remember what the name of it is, which allows you to run an, an Java X script, script in a browser and all the output uh, is treated as HTML. So you can actually do HTML types of things in, in, in that view. So um, I've seen that around, so. Yes? Uh, 
Yes. Um, let's. That's. Uh, okay. The way we've currently structured uh, NAS Warren is that you can have one context per thread. Okay. If you want to, if you want to uh, run multi-threaded, you'd have to create a separate context, uh, um, a separate context to, to run it in on a separate thread. So there's no possibility of collision of objects. And if you want the two threads to talk to each other, you have to use JSON to to pass messages across. Now that's our short term goal and that's the way NAS Horn will go out the door. But our long term goal is to basically focus on that solution, the solution for multi-threading JavaScript. Okay. Yes? There was one code snippet where you overwrote a Java method with a JavaScript function. Yes. Assigning it to the simple name of the method. Yes. Um I don't know. It, no, it doesn't. It doesn't currently, right? Not, not yet. Oh, yeah, not yet. We don't have a solution for that. Uh, uh, the way overloading uh, handling works uh, in, a, in a simple call is that you can actually specify the argument types uh, when you're trying to access the property, uh, but we don't have a simple solution to that yet. Um, we're basically trying to handle the sort of the typical case right now, uh, but, but uh, you know, that's something that we'll we have to focus on or work on as we go on. So. Yes? It looks like you've implemented those module system. Will require calls to see the rest of the code so that you can reuse libraries? Um, will NPM work natively? Or will you have to do a report of NPM? Can you answer that one? You didn't actually hear the whole thing. You have to speak up a little bit. I can't hear you. As long as the, the long as the package is installed, then no can access it. So, are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you have any benchmarking against other? Yep. Stuff yet? Yep. Not going to show that. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> should have been session this morning. Yeah, it should have been a session. Okay, so the thing, the the question is a performance question. Um, it's. Uh, I'm not trying to duck it, but the thing is that if we were to actually t tell you what our performance is now, it, it wouldn't really be relevant to when we ship, right? Because the thing is that uh, you know we have uh, time to, to move on with some of the stuff. Uh, our, there are some issues um, in the JVM that we have to work out, and uh, once we work that out, our performance levels should be right up there. So, so, and, and we actually work quite closely to the JVM team, and that's. We're sort of there. Um, this, this isn't all all software side. It's basically we have to, uh, as far as the JavaScript is concerned, we also have to worry about the JVM and the implementations of things in the JVM as well. So, any other questions? Yes. Uh, Sandbox it in the sense that it runs in a separate. Well, uh, you give access to Java objects, like Java IO, which usually don't have that JavaScript. Right. So uh, when you execute, if you're executing multi-threaded, uh, you get a separate context. So um, there's no cross chatter between the two things, so that um, um, uh, they can't interfere with each other's objects. Uh, but they also, but they're sharing the same memory space, so it's not a true sandbox, right? The yeah. Oh, permissions. Oh, permissions. Oh, so, oh, yes. Yeah. So there's a permissions file that you can specify the exact. Yeah. No, you can you can specify whatever you want. It's a very fine, uh, fine grained uh, security model. Uh, so you can basically, you know, right down to the to the to the class and uh, that you want isolated. So, yeah. Basically, you can say all of all of I/O is is basically off limits if you want. 
Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Thank you very much.